Welcome everyone. Good evening. My name is Shirley and I will be your moderator tonight. Our webinar this evening is again titled New in 2024, a guide to the top CDT code changes. I'm excited to welcome Dr. Greg Grobmeyer as our speaker tonight. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to go over some quick housekeeping. If you have a question, please go ahead and type it into the Q&A box and we will address them at the end of the webinar. CE is not available for tonight's webinar. Welcome Dr. Grobmeyer and thank you so much for being with us. I will pass it over to you now. Hey, thank you so much for allowing me to be here. I always uh, welcome the opportunity to, uh, to, to speak on the new code set. I know this is and it, it may be weird or boring to a lot of uh, the population, but this is my jam. This is kind of our thing. And so for us code geeks, insurance people, this is actually an interesting time of year. We'll get to see what uh, new toys we get to play with and things we get to talk about. So I'm going to dive into this and kind of discuss uh, what the new codes are, what the changes are for 2024, how best to utilize those what we expect the payers to do and uh, what we expect you to need to do to get reimbursed for these particular procedures. So before I can do anything like that, though, uh, I do want to talk about my sponsor today. Uh, eAssist is a parent company of my company, which is Practice Booster. Uh, you may have heard of us being uh, the, the Dental Coding and Confidence Manual that I hope a lot of you guys have in your offices is a is a wonderful retour, resource uh, to CDT coding. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. But eAssist is my lovely sponsor today. I'd like to thank them for allowing me to present today. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about them. They've been around. They're one of the first uh, outsourcing dental, dental benefit companies uh, that was there. And so uh, they kind of uh, were one of the early... Uh, uh, companies to, to create this concept, uh, to put this as a as an option for dentists. And uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful resource. They've just grown. And right now they're probably the biggest in the market uh, for what they do. And I have to say one of the best at what they do. And so to date, uh, they have collected more than $15 billion from insurance companies. That's billion with a B not an M. And so uh, they've been working at this for about, uh, for over 10 years now. Uh, you probably know them best as a dental billing outsource company, meaning they will, they'll do your dental billing for you. They, they do submissions, they work the claims, they make sure that the claims get paid. Uh, but that's not all they do. We want to talk about a few of the other services that ESS does offer. And so you're familiar with the, uh, the insurance billing and aging. Uh, insurance billage, uh, billing and aging is probably their, that's their main uh, bread and butter service. That's the thing they've been doing the longest. They do that very, very well. But they also offer these other uh, resources that you may be interested in. Each one of these is kind of available as independent type products. And so uh, stuff you may want to talk to them about. So credentialing services and fee schedule updates. They'll, they'll actually make sure that uh, you're staying on top of where your fees need to be. Uh, they will also make sure that your doctors are credentialed with uh, the appropriate insurance companies that your uh, uh, billing entity is in partnership with. So uh, insurance verification and eligibility. How much time do you spend having someone sit on your phone? It may be you if you're the insurance coordinator for your office, or uh, if you're one of the dentists, how how often or how long are you paying somebody to sit on the phone on hold with the dental office to get insurance verification? Not all the stuff is available over the portal, over the uh, the, the the web uh, to to be able to got uh, get automatically. So ESS does this for you. They'll be able to 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 sit and and make sure that the insurance verification is up to date that the patient is confirmed to be eligible prior to them even setting foot in the practice. And so that's a huge uh, time saver for your, your practice. Uh, dental practice accounting, bookkeeping, and payroll. Uh, ESS themselves uh, has 
CPAs, so they are they are official uh, certified public accountants uh, that are doing this service. Uh, they work exclusively with dental practices, and so this is a way to get uh, people who really know what they're doing when it's a, uh, associated with a dental practice, uh, and not just the same person that's doing bookkeeping or accounting for you know. Uh, uh, you know, tax preparation for just consumers or other types of businesses. This is very dental specific. They know what they're doing. They're the experts in this. Uh, patient portion statements and billing. And so they're actually able to, to do the billing and not only the original statements, but also chasing down the money, the collections. Those collection calls are kind of ugly sometimes. You don't necessarily want to spend a lot of time and effort doing that. It's not a pleasant task. And so why not hand that over to somebody who's, who really knows how to do that well? Uh, this is what they do. They are the experts. And so handing that over to them and allowing them to, to, to do that service for you is uh, a phenomenal thing. Uh, full schedule patient recall and retention. They actually can, can go into your practice management software and try to reactivate patients who have outstanding operative work that's still on the book or people who haven't been in in a while, they'll get those patients reactivated back on the books. Uh, make sure that your schedule stays full. So all these are services that eAssist offers. When it comes to dental outsourcing uh, for this type of thing, I, I find a lot of practices are hesitant to do this. But at the same time, if you've got a root canal that is a little more complex than you feel like you're able to do, you're going to send that out to an endodontist. And if you've got a, uh, a tooth that the roots are curved and crooked and weird or bulbous, you're going to be sending that to an oral surgeon. E-Assist is a specialist. They are a specialist in dental billing and aging and all these other things that I just discussed. So they're another re referral source for you. They're able to take some of the pressure off your front desk team uh, by outsourcing some of these services, the people who are actually physically in the office can get to their prime focus of taking care of the patients that are in front of them, that are on the phone, the ones that, uh, you know, that personal relationship. Those are the things that the, 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 uh, the team members who are in the office need to be focusing on. So this is a great way to outsource some of those services uh, that can be done by somebody off-site. So let's move along. I'll tell you a little bit about who I am before we get into all this. Uh, I'm the uh, senior advisor and the editor-in-chief of uh, Practice Booster. Practice Booster was started by Dr. Charles Blair. I hope you guys know Dr. Blair. Uh, I hate to report that Dr. Blair passed away in this last, uh, this last November. I don't know if you all have, have heard about it that or not. He was the goat when it comes to uh, dental billing, dental uh, coding, specifically uh, dental insurance in all forms and fashions. He was he was an industry giant, uh, one of the first people to, to step into this as an, as an expert, and uh, he knew all things. And so I was proud to be able to have him as my mentor for the last many years and, and uh, as a great friend as well. And so uh, we, we mourn the loss of Dr. Blair, but his legacy is going to continue. And we're going to continue creating the, the wonderful products that he set forth. Uh, we're going to continue working and offering the services the Practice Booster uh, was able to offer under his guidance. And so back to me. Uh, I practice here in uh, Tennessee. I'm over in Chattanooga, Tennessee now. Uh, but I did practice in West Tennessee for about a decade in the Jackson area, uh, he ended up going through a cancer battle when I was only 36. It's pretty young, but that left me with peripheral neuropathy. I ended up having numb fingers, numb feet, tend to drop things. Nobody wants to go to a dentist who drops a handpiece. So, and I didn't want to be a malpractice case waiting to happen. So I stepped out of the clinical side of things and into the delivery of coaching and consulting, working with patients or, or practices across the nation uh, did that for many years before I got into industry writing specifically. I worked a lot with uh, websites and journals and, and, and different things like that. And 
as well as a lot of consumer facing things. I got to write for Reader's Digest and for Slate Magazine and New York Magazine and Men's Health and uh, a lot of fun stuff like that. Uh, and so uh, from there, I stepped into working with Dr. Blair. I took over the Insurance Solutions newsletter many years ago. So if you guys are familiar with that publication or have been receiving that, that is my writing. And so for the most part, and, uh, and so Insurance Solutions Newsletter then moved into uh, the chief editorship of the Coding with Confidence Manual. So if you guys have the book in your office uh, and it's a fairly recent copy in the last four or five years, then that's, that's something I've had my, my hand in. Up till now, Dr. Blair and I worked on that together. Uh, we were co-creators, co-editors, co-writers of this resource. And so I'm going to miss him going forward in the creation of this, this, uh, the, the 2025 editions of the book. We rewrite the book every single year. So it's a big project and, uh, his loss is going to be, uh, quite a, quite a thing for me, but we'll make it work. So I'm also the host of our, uh, Dental Code Advisor podcast. I do the revenue enhancement programs, which is the one-on-one fee analysis and consulting program. And uh, am a writer for all the books that practice booster officers, office, offers. I'll be able to speak in a minute, I hope. Um, I'm a course creator and a lecturer for dentalzing.com. And I do the revenue enhancement program as well. So moving on. Disclaimer before we get off into it too much. Coding is accurate as of today. I have to kind of say that because things change. Things change all the time. Sometimes there are mid-year updates. Uh, laws change. Uh, we want to make sure that we're constantly staying current with things. And so this presentation is accurate to the best of our knowledge. As of today's date of service, I can't guarantee that in the future you come back and look at it, uh, that everything I say is going to be the same. So always code what you do. That's the golden rule of coding. Follow the code set uh, to the best of your ability. And this uh, presentation is for employees informational and training purposes only. This is not legal advice. I am not an attorney, uh, don't uh, care to be one. And so if you do need legal advice, please consult with a healthcare attorney in your particular state. Moving on, what we're gonna do, uh, what we're gonna learn today, we're gonna talk about a lot of the, the code changes that happened for 2024. Why are, why are they important? How are they gonna affect you and your practice? what it's going to take for you to be able to uh, submit clean claims and get reimbursements for these new codes. We're going to recognize why billing and coding expertise is essential for your practice and discover how these code changes actually affect patient satisfaction. So uh, we want to make sure that we're doing things right the first time. Here's an interesting fact and figure. Why are these things so important to dental professionals? Uh, according to the National Association of Dental Plans, the NADP, we've got over two-thirds of dentists leaving 9% of collectible revenue on the table each month. What I mean by collectible revenue, I'm talking about money that is owed to the practice legitimately after write-offs, after all everything's taken out by the insurance company, you're still leaving 9% sitting out there that could be rightfully yours. And so uh, on national average, 91% uh, was the collectible revenue that uh, most dental practices are managing to actually get into their hands. That extra 9% is huge though. So if we've got 70% of dentists that are leaving 9% of revenue on the table, what does that look like? 9% doesn't sound like much, but think about this. We're talking about 9% of bottom line revenue. We're talking about after overhead is paid. So if you've got a practice that is 60% overhead, 40% profit margin, you got a 40% profit margin, that 9% goes right on top of that 40% to make it 50%. That is an increase of 25% to the bottom line profit of that practice. So think about it that way. It's actually bigger than than uh, than what you might think because this is pure profit. So unnecessary claim denials are a big 
part of what's causing you to lose this revenue. Now, these numbers are a little old. This is from a 2020 uh, survey of dental practices from uh, the ADA's Health Policy Institute. So average dental uh, uh, gross billings at the time were $732,000. i am I'm betting it's closer to a million now. Most of the practices that I'm working with and one-on-one consulting are well over a million, uh, so are, are hovering right around a million if it's a solo practitioner, uh, for sure, depending on your area of the country. But if your average gross deal, uh, dental billings were 732000 that 9% uh, translates to $66,000 a year that's owed to you that you're just saying, eh, it's okay if I don't collect that. Over a period of 40 years, which is a average lifespan of a dentist and dental practice, we're talking two and a half million dollars. And that's based on that $700,000 number. Most of you are probably doing that or better. And so take that and extrapolate it for what your actual dental practice gross billings are and imagine what that average uncollected fee would be over the course of time. We're talking some pretty big numbers, okay? So what can you do? Uh, a big part of this is accurate claim submission. We've got a lot of uh, uh, claims that are going out that end up getting denials. They end up getting delayed payments, which also costs you money. Uh, uh, but it may be things that you could collect and you just don't realize that you that you could. So the claims are often denied for little bitty things. So, uh, incorrect CDT coding is one of them. And that's, that's where I come in. We're going to uh, teach you about how to code correctly for the services that you're providing. Missing documentation. We, we speak largely on what documentation, what narratives, what attachments, what things need to go along with a dental claim to make sure it gets paid the first time. The vast majority of denials are for something like this. And in fact, um, only 33% of denied claims are ever appealed. Two thirds of denied claims are practices just going, okay, all right, well, so be it, and accepting that. And they're not going back and, uh, and resubmitting. And I challenge you, please resubmit, please fight these things. Please figure out what was wrong and see if you can correct these issues. A lot of times it's something so small and uh, it could be resubmitted uh, without much much difficulty. Uh, uh, we can uh, teach you some language on how to, to speak uh, to the procedure that you're doing, what documentation you need to back up medical necessity for the services that you are offering. Those are things that we all teach and that helps those claims get through the first time. Uh, those delay, those delays, those denials, they cost you money every time. Um, without up-to-date coding resources and teaching, uh, dental practices risk having claims denied unnecessarily. That, again, uh, goes along with what I was just saying about uh, a specific example that uh, we're seeing an uptick in denials due to the use of artificial intelligence on the payer side, Okay. Uh, AI is being used a lot in dental practices for uh, looking at radiographs. It may be using, uh, being used for patient communication, lots of other uses of AI within the dental practice. But the payers are actually using AI uh, both to adjudicate claims. So it's looking at scanning text when those claims are first coming through. So you have to have the right keywords. You have to have the right language in place. You have to know what to say in those narratives. And then you have to have the right attachments to go along with it. And AI is being used to look at those attachments as well, including the radiographs that you're sending. Uh, if you send in a claim for SRP, uh, they are now looking at that radiograph to see if you have uh, two millimeters or more of bone loss from the CEJ to the crest of bone. If the AI is determining that you do not have two millimeters of bone loss, they may downgrade or deny that claim. Those are things that you need to know. Uh, those are the kinds of things that we, we end up teaching, uh, and it's constantly changing this information, the, the tips, the tricks, the things that you need to know to be successful with claim submission. So you can appeal. You can fight these things. 
So quick poll. I'm going to give this about a minute. Do you guys currently use a coding resource to help you send clean claims? Now, this could be Practice Booster, our company. Uh, this could also be um, uh, the, the ADA puts out a CDT coding mania, manual. They put out a coding companion book, which uh, is a list of questions and answers uh, that give scenarios and, 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 uh, and how certain things should be coded. And so do you use a coding resource to help you send clean claims? And is it current? Is it current? How old is your book? That's one of the questions that uh, you need to think about. So if it's not current, this doesn't count. So I'm giving it just a moment for you to be able to lock into an answer. Um, Shirley, have we got some uh, responses coming in? Uh, we sure do. So far, people are still answering. And so far, 67% of the respondents, uh, now we're up to 68%, are saying that they um, do currently use a coding resource to help them send clean claims. So we have 68, reason. yep. And we've got about 32% that now. Excellent, excellent. Well, for the 30% that don't, I encourage you to to find some resource, whether it be ours or uh uh, the ADA book is phenomenal, uh, especially the Coding Companion book. The uh, the CDT manual itself is a list of the codes. doesn't tell you how to use them very much. The Coding Companion gives more scenarios, uh, gives uh, particular uh, uh, procedures that were done, and then how you would code for that. Uh, Practice Booster with the Dental Coding with Confidence manual expands on that further. We speak to some things that the ADA really can't speak to. We talk about the payer side of things what narratives need to be attached, what attachments need to go with it, uh, what to expect back from them, that kind of thing. A little further explanation of what the codes mean, what other you know codes you might be confusing uh, this code with another, some common errors that are made, and, uh, and that sort of material. So we'll, I'll show you some examples of that maybe later on. Let's, let's get on into the meat of this thing. So note that even dentists who are fee-for-service if you are submitting claims on behalf of your patients, you can still be audited, okay? You can still be audited. And so audits are not just for uh, people that are in contract. And so don't think that you're completely uh, in the clear because you're not uh, contractually obligated. Uh, if you are a fee-for-service practice, that does take away a lot of the handcuffs involved with PPO participation. However, you're still getting looked at. Every time you see new claims, they have the right to, to, to check things and they are monitoring your ratios. If your crown to buildup ratio is uh, incorrect, if you've got way more buildups than what national average is, that could flag you for audit. If you have a lot more surgical extractions than would normally be seen in a GP practice uh, compared to simple extractions, that may flag you for audit. If you're not uh, uh, documenting in your clinical notes that you are uh, requesting certain radiographs, that you're prescribing those, uh, if your documentation is off and they see the notes from the date of service uh, upon a submission, that could be something that flags you for audit. They're looking for opportunities to come into your practice and get some money back, okay? We don't want them to be able to do that. So we want to make sure that we're teaching good documentation, good coding, and, uh, and, and, and go forward with that. So here's my buddy Charles, Charles Blair. Correct coding often results in higher revenue. His practices obtain reimbursements that were once unpaid because of misunderstanding or misreported codes. It's actually the truth. So golden cool uh, rule of coding is always to code for what you do. Don't change it. Don't up you know, change it to something that's more aggressive because it's going to get a higher reimbursement. Code for what you do, but make sure that you, you've got uh, a good narratives and good things that go along with it. Changes to ADA codes. Let's look at the last couple of years. Over Since 2020, there have been over 200 changes to the CDT code set. 200 changes. So if you haven't updated your coding resources since the pandemic, you're 200 behind, okay? Uh, last year, we had uh, 
38 changes. We had 46 changes the year before that. It was 61 the year before that. Uh, this year we had fewer than normal. We had 16 total changes plus uh, one additional new category of service, okay, uh, which I'll talk about in just a moment. So do you really know, are you aware of what all these changes are? That's the things that we're going to talk about today. I'm not going to hit them all, but I'm going to hit the ones that apply to most general practitioners. So let's discuss uh, a lot of these codes uh, in, in a little more depth. All right. So first thing, if you don't, if you want to see a full webinar on this, uh, you can go to dentalzing.com. I have at least uh, two different versions, one that includes the, the new ADA claim form uh, and one without that goes into a lot of depth on each and every code. So uh, you can go back and look at it there. Um, again, not sure of reimbursements or uh, what all is covered and what's not going to be covered yet. These are brand new codes. We have yet to see what payers are going to do. Uh, we've got uh, at least some idea from their updates that they've sent out, uh, what services they consider that they're going to cover and some that they aren't. We don't know what the fees look like, what the UCRs are going to look like yet, though. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. First code I'm going to touch on is one in the diagnostic category service. It's the 3D printing of a 3D surface scan. So last year, we got D0801 which is a code for direct intraoral scanning of uh, the oral cavity. And so M802 for scanning of a model, if you wanted to put a model, physical model into a digital uh, format. So they felt like the other half of the coin was, was going the other direction, taking a digital model and creating a physical model from it. So D0396 was created by the Code Maintenance Committee in March uh, they voted on this and, and decided this was a good thing. Uh, payers are probably not going to be reimbursing for this if it's done as a routine part of the fabrication pro process of a dental prosthesis. Uh, it's, it's considered like an impression, uh, but if you are fee-for-service, this is something that you can pass that cost on to the patient. If you're, if you're in network, uh, you are participating, then it may be something uh, that you can use for documentation purposes, uh, when you are creating a uh, three-dimensional model for whatever service that it is that you're providing. So that's the first one that we're going to talk about. Uh, I've got a lot of code tips over here on the right columns. If you guys want to uh, look at those, screenshot those, or review those, there's more information there that I'm probably going to actually speak. I'm not going to read the whole thing off to you. So um, The next code we're going to talk about is a code that you guys use all the time. 2335, this was the, uh, it was a standout amongst CDT. You had uh, the 2230 through 2233 codes, which were the one surface, two surface, three surface composite resin codes for anterior uh, teeth. And then there was this one, 2335 was a little different. The way it has been written, uh, historically, it said, or involving the incisal angle. And it went on to, to uh, define the incisal angle as a corner of the tooth. It, it could involve, it has to involve the incisal and either a mesial or distal of the tooth. Uh, and it probably is going to involve uh, a, a, perhaps a, a facial or lingual aspect, but it didn't necessarily have to be four surfaces. Okay. So prior to January 1, you could code 2335. Anytime that you were doing a, a corner of a tooth, even if it wasn't a full four surfaces, okay? Now they've simplified things. They're making the coding consistent amongst the entire uh, code set. That was kind of confusing. A lot of people didn't even know that was an option. And so what they're doing now is totally counting it on surfaces. If you did three surfaces, it's a three surface composite resin. If you do four or more, it is now the 2335. So that's the update there. Um, D2976, this is a service that uh, some pediatric practices especially need to know working on kids, working on uh, 
young adults that may not be ready for a full coverage restoration yet, this is a good provisionaliz provisionalization technique. It is a way to, uh, to take one of these big fillings that you know needs a crown, but the patient may not be old enough or ready uh, for whatever reason to be able to do a crown at this time. This is a way to give it some strength uh, to, to make it uh, provisional. You can, you can keep it this way for a while. So it's using a uh, orthodontic band. You could be using it as a matrix, perhaps, for actually placing the restoration. But uh, the orthodontic band is removed and normally reseated uh, with cement in place. If it doesn't come off, it's, it doesn't specify that it has to be re-cemented into place. But uh, normally that is the procedure. It's going to be cemented and left in place as a kind of a long-term provisional restoration to hold and give that multi-surface restoration uh, strength until full cuspal coverage can happen with a definitive restoration on down the road. So D2976, looking at what the payers have said about this, most of the ones that I've looked at said that they're going to allow this once per tooth uh, per lifetime, and they're going to, but it would only be for posterior teeth, not anterior teeth, which is probably when you're going to be using this anyway. Uh, and so that is coded in addition to whatever the, uh, resin is that you're placing in there. So if you're placing a four surface resin, you're going to additionally code out D2976 for the band stabilization of that restoration uh, by placement of the uh, orthodontic band around the outside of that thing. So that's, that's that. Let's move along to the next code, D2989. This is what I'm, I'm happy to see. Previously, uh, the only way to code for this uh, situation would have been a 2999, which would be an unspecified restorative service by report. Uh, now there is a code for excavation of a tooth resulting in the determination of non-restorability. So what we're talking about is you've spent an hour digging decay out of this tooth, and then you find out, oh, we've got a furcation uh, perforation. We've got so much tooth gone that this tooth is not really salvageable. And so we're going to have to do something provisionalized, and it's going to end up uh, being lost. We're going to have to take it out. So uh, coding for D2989 is appropriate in that situation. Most of the payers, we believe, are only going to cover this if it is either a referral out to the oral surgeon for the extraction, so you're not getting... You're not doing the extraction in-house, uh, or you're doing the extraction perhaps on another date of service, okay? That might be a situation where it's covered. It depends upon the uh, the plan language, and I haven't seen enough plans yet uh, to know exactly how this is going to be uh, viewed by payers, but uh, that's, that's the thought. Uh, if you end up doing $29.89 and then immediately taking out the tooth yourself, on the same date of service, it's likely not going to be a covered service. It could be used for documentation purposes, but uh, it won't be a covered service if you end up taking out the actual uh, tooth that day. So that's our thoughts about that. Let's take a look at the next code. We're rolling right along. Uh, this one's cool. This is a, uh, a fairly new procedure. It has been out for a year or two. Uh, I'm not sure how long, but uh, it's unique enough that it it got its own CDT code. This is application of hydroxyapatite regeneration medicament per tooth, uh, 2991. You'll notice it is in the restorative category of service. It's not a preventive service. This is restorative because we are talking about um, using this in situations where there is active decay, okay? And so, and it doesn't just stop decay or arrest decay like the 1354 code would be that you'd use with SDF. This is a situation where uh, it's a material that contains a peptide that you acid etch, you place uh, the material on the tooth. The current uh, uh, provider of this material is called Churidont Repair. That's the product name. 
uh, that's out currently. There are other ones that are about to be out. It's not going to be the only. Uh, so it's not product specific. But right now, Curodont Repair, that's C-U-R-O-D-O-N-T, uh, Repair. Uh, it is a peptide on a little sponge. You're using this either in demineralized areas. You can also uh, floss that interproximally for those little incipient caries. Those places you've been marking watch in your treatment plan can be treated with this, okay? The peptide soaks into the base of the incipient decay, and then over the course of six months to a year, it attracts calcium and phosphorus from the saliva and, and allows the, a scaffolding to rebuild hydroxyapatite or natural tooth enamel. So it's not just replacing it with uh, resin like a, a D2990, which is the DMG Icon product, uh, where you would etch and pump it full of resin. This actually is creating a scaffolding to rebuild a crystalline enamel on a tooth. So it's truly healing a tooth. Uh, very unique, very interesting product. I'm interested to see uh, its long-term usage and how it's going to affect industry. So that's that's a pretty cool code. Uh, research it a little more. The The parent company is V Vardis. It's a little V, then a big V. I'm not sure why. V-A-R-D-I-S. And so, uh, but you can uh, you can Google that and and check them out. And Curadon Repair is the particular product that this would be uh, applicable for. They made a revision to this code. This is not a new code, uh, but they did they did add a uh, descriptor to this code. Uh, when you're looking at a code, there's the the number itself, which is the procedure code. There's the, the, the words that are there in black. That is the nomenclature, uh, which is the, the main part that kind of describes what the code does. But a lot of codes have this additional descriptor. It's a paragraph that they stick at the bottom that tells you all about what the code should be, criteria, how it should be used. One of the things that we teach is we go through and we teach about those descriptors because a lot of those criteria, if not all met, if you're, heaven forbid, ever audited and you haven't met all the criteria that are hidden down in this descriptor that you're probably not even looking at unless you're reading about the code, then on audit, an insurance company can take money back for those particular procedures. So different codes have different things. This particular situation, they wanted to clarify that this was add a use of a metal substructure in a removable, complete denture not a partial, nothing else. It's a removable, complete denture. It's not a fixed hybrid. It's a different thing. So this could be added to an existing uh, denture, or it could be when during the fabrication of a new denture. But it's usually used on uh, somebody that's bruxing. They've cracked dentures. They, they tend to break them. Uh, they have a history of this. Uh, you need to write all that in your narrative. Make sure that you're, you're, you're stating why you're feeling like this is a medical necessity to offer that metal substructure to the denture. And so, uh, uh, but doing so, they did want to clarify, we're wanting to make sure that all the criteria are met of the descriptor for that code. So moving on to the next one. This was a void. This was a gap that we had in uh, the CDT code set. Uh, accessing and retorquing loose implant screw per screw. So we're not talking about completely removing a prosthesis or replacing screws entirely. Those have different codes, okay? Uh, this is a situation where uh, you've got a prosthesis. It may be a crown. It may be an all-on four. It could be any type of uh, a screw-retained uh, implant uh, prosthesis. The thing is a little loose. You're probably drilling out filling material if it's placed over the hole. You're going to then uh, torque that thing back down. You're going to make it make it tight again. If you feel like the screw is still uh, 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 usable, functional, you're not having to replace it. And then you're going to put uh, uh, filling material back in the hole. Now, that's a, a code that we got last year, the D6197, a replacement of restorative material in the access hole. Make sure you look that code up. There's specific situations where you can use it and you can't. 
this is a code you can use it with. So you can uh, you can take out the uh, filling material, retorque it, get it nice and tight again, put new filling material in, and things are back to the way they were. Now, if you remove the prosthesis entirely, you're probably talking about the implant maintenance procedure. That's the D6080 uh, code. So please read up on that one as well. Let's look on. Okay, D7939. I went on and included this one. It's probably not going to apply to a lot of practices, but I included this one for the cool factor. This is robotic assisted dynamic navigation. It's actually not for the actual robotic placement of the restoration. It is for the index that the robot uses in robotic implant placement. And so, or any type of ostomy surgery, if it's robotic guided, doesn't even it doesn't even specify that it is specific to implant placement. If you're doing osteotomy with a robot, this this code could be used. What the index is is a reference point. So if you're placing implants on the lower right, this may be a block that's placed on the lower left that the uh, robot is using as a reference point to make sure that the angulation is correct, that uh, it's guiding your hand in such a way uh, that you can't mess up. So the nice thing about this, it's unlike a, uh, a surgical splint, which is very, or a surgical guide, I'm sorry, a surgical guide for implant placement, which is very specific, it, uh, it's, uh, it's fixed. This is dynamic. This actually allows you to change angulation a little bit. It allows you to change depth uh, at the time of implant placement based upon practitioner discretion. However, it's limited, okay? The robot itself kind of makes sure that you don't go to the point of hitting particular uh, structures, anatomical structures that would be bad. We don't want to hit the uh, inferior alveolar nerve. We don't want to, you know, uh, perf anything. So it keeps you on angle. It keeps you doing things right. But this is the reference point uh, that that robot is using. Uh, there's the robot that's out there and being used. It's FDA cleared at this time. is called Yomi, uh, Y-O-M-I. It's from a company called Neosys. And uh, it's a pretty neat thing. I got a great friend who's who's using uh, this for uh, uh, implant placement in almost all of his implants uh, over in Knoxville, Tennessee. So let's move along. Uh, next, we're going to talk about some things were already in the adjunctive category of service. So we're kind of rounding out, getting to the to the near the end of this code set stuff. Uh, if you'll, this is a little unusual, okay? This one's for fabrication of essentially an Essex appliance. Essex is the is a name brand, so there's other clear plastic appliances out there, uh, but that's the one that most people would recognize. And it's a situation for aesthetic purposes, you're putting a tooth in there, okay? So it could be used uh, for uh, aesthetics. So the patient has a front tooth while healing is going on. So you'll notice this one's for fabrication. There is another code for placement. Uh, ADA decided to split this in half, which is unusual. We really haven't seen this in other CDT codes uh, to, to separate the placement and from the fabrication. And so curious how this is going to play out and how it's going to be used, how it's going to be reimbursed. I believe this was done because sometimes the person who created the prosthetic is not the one who's actually doing the extraction and placing the uh, aesthetic appliance at the time. So the GP may be making the Essex appliance and have that ready to go for the oral surgeon to do the extraction or implant placement or whatever might be happening. And so uh, two different providers can provide two different codes for the different steps of this that they're doing. As far as reimbursement goes, more than likely, though, uh, if you're doing it yourself in office, uh, insurances tend to pay upon completion of a procedure. So more than likely, the placement is going to be the half of this that would get reimbursed, uh, and the other half would be for diagnostic purposes. However, if it is a situation where it's a different provider, you may want to break that up and, and have that noted in the service. Uh, once the procedure is completed by the other provider, then you should get reimbursement. Um, next, we have, there's actually four new codes 
uh, that are related to sleep or sleep medicine, sleep apnea, okay? I picked this one because this one's probably going to be most applicable to general uh, practices. It's screening for sleep-related breathing disorders. So you don't have to necessarily be a sleep medicine doctor or a sleep apnea uh, provider to screen patients for sleep-related uh, breathing disorders. If they've got a large neck circumference, if you feel like uh, they are uh, a high BMI, uh, high blood pressure, a uh, history of sleep problems, wife says they snore really loud. Those are all things that could go into a, a screening and you can get them referred over to a proper sleep doctor for the diagnosis of sleep apnea. Uh, if you are a, a doctor that's providing sleep apnea services, uh, four new codes for you this year. This is just one of them. Uh, and because of all these new codes, okay, they have now created a new category of service, and it is sleep apnea services. They've carved it out, okay? Uh, it still falls uh, in the 9,000s. And so all the new sleep apnea codes, uh, so there were four existing, there's four new ones. They have pulled those out, and they're going to make, instead of adjunctive general services, this is going to fall as sleep apnea services which is going to fall after the adjunctive general services category. And it's got codes that are numerically in the 9,000s. But there are some adjunctive general services codes that are kind of in the middle or mixed in uh, in numerical order to where the adjunctive general services category uh, uh, was. And so to be able to pull these out, they couldn't just define a range. They couldn't say... Like, you know, we've got with implant services is 6,000 to 6199, okay? They couldn't do that because they still, they're using some codes that are mixed in in the middle that still fall in adjunctive general services. So if you look at the, the new CDT books and things like that, they're doing away with defining categories of services by numeric ranges. They're not going to have D100 to D999 written in your book anymore. It's just going to say diagnostic. The code numbers aren't changing. They're not screwing with any of that. It's still going to be the same, but uh, they are doing away with the code ranges uh, in all their literature uh, because it's not going to fit uh, for this 9,000 section anymore. So that's interesting. So looking back over the whole thing, uh, let's take a peek for just 2023, 2024, all these blue ones are revisions. The red ones are deletions. The black ones are brand new codes. So these are just this year and last year. Uh, so that's that's quite a few. And then, like I said, if you go back to 2020, we're talking 200 code changes. That's a lot. So be sure you're keeping up with these things, that you are aware of these changes, that you are using a current uh, uh, code resource it's going to tell you what these changes are, how to use the new codes, what to expect from payers. Uh, in addition to the new category of service, the new codes, uh, if you're not aware, you should be. We've got a brand new 2024 ADA dental claim form. So this is this went into effect January 1st. Okay, This replaces the 2019 ADA dental claim form. So if you haven't uh, gotten this update yet, um, it's gonna, it takes a while for, for different uh, providers to roll this out. So ADA makes the change, and then it's got to be updated within all the practice management softwares. It's got to be updated at all the clearing houses. It takes a little while for that to happen. So if you don't have the 2024 claim form active yet, don't freak out. It's okay. Everything that's in the 2024 uh, dental claim form was additive. It was additional boxes that were, uh, you know, if there was already a box 11, that created an 11B. Uh, they put an additional box that adds an additional piece of information. Uh, the three big ones were date of last SRP, uh, uh, things about locum tenens, um, and then there was uh, things about additional payers. Uh, those are the, the, the big stuff, okay? Uh, if you've got your secondary payers, there's now like boxes 
for entering all that new additional information. There are some other changes as well. Be sure you're 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 looking at uh, ADA's website has a great little video on it. Uh, an update on that. We've got some stuff on our website as well at practicebooster.com. Uh, you're welcome to to look at that. We've got a uh, class, uh, two classes actually that, that talk about it on dentalzing.com. And so if you want to go there and watch those videos, you can actually get CE credit for those classes. And so love for you to look at that stuff, uh, find out how to use this form effectively. So if you're feeling overwhelmed, it's okay. We've got resources for you. Everybody is overwhelmed by this stuff. You know, but uh, we've got a lot of resources. Reach out to your Henry Shine field service rep. Those guys can point you in the right direction. They're going to tell you where you need to go to be able to get more information, more details, make sure that you're doing things correctly. So, um, and in addition to that, again, I would love to invite you to take a look at the new Coding with Confidence manual. Uh, this QR code, if you hold up your phone and uh, and, and, and take up, up or as if you're going to take a picture, it should pop up a link for you to a sampler that's going to show you a little bit of the Coding with Confidence manual, what it is, uh, how it looks for 2024, and how it's different. It's a little, it's, it's more than, it goes into a lot more depth. This is a 550-page book. Uh, which is considerably more uh, in-depth and involved than some of the other resources that are out there. So uh, I hope you use this as your coding Bible. Uh, I would, I would, I would uh, highly suggest it be in every practice everywhere. Uh, practice Booster offers, in addition to this, an administration book. We uh, offer uh, one-on-one consulting, uh, fee analysis, uh, going over your coding and doing... Uh, a three hour, I'm happy to talk for you with you for an extended period and review your coding, tell you the codes you're not using, which ones you're using correctly, which ones you aren't, uh, what narratives, what attachments, things like that. A great coding review through our revenue enhancement program. It's wonderful. We've got a documentation book. We've got a, a new karma compliance calendar that's really cool that keeps you on track of all your, uh, your lab maintenance what you need to be doing for OSHA, what you need to be doing for HIPAA. Uh, and, and and it's all on the calendar, so you don't lose track of those things. Neat little product. Uh, so go out to the store and check that out as well. We'd love to have you. So with that said, we're coming up at the top of the hour. I'm going to go into some Q&A and, uh, and have that discussion. Again, if you want to uh, reach out to the uh, business solutions team at Henry Shine, they can help you. Or if you talk to your individual field rep, they'd be happy to, uh, to discuss that with you further. Uh, I'm going to leave this slide up while I do the Q&A. Um, uh, this uh, uh, presentation will be available at henryshinedental.com backslash webinars. So do go out and take a look at that. Uh, but I'm going to leave this contact information in place for just a little bit while I look for uh, 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 some different questions, coding questions. Uh, MI paste can't be used for 2999. That was uh, a comment that somebody made. Um, all coding is going to be procedure specific. And so I don't believe I said anything about MI paste in the, in the, the lecture this time. Um, I did say uh, DMG icon, which was the 2990 code. Uh, MI paste, as far as its usage, that can be used uh, and coded in many different ways. It can be used as a desensitizer. There's a code for that. Uh, it can be used uh, as a for remineralization. If it's a take home, it's the uh, 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 it's the uh, take home medicaments uh, uh, code, and so you're looking at 9630 for that. Uh, so it can be coded in many different ways. The new code that was that we discussed was the D2991, the application of hydroxyapatite regeneration medicament. Uh, that one is uh, can be used also for remineralization, much like MI paste has been used in the past. Uh, it's likely a more effective product. Uh, honestly, it's actually going to remineralize with tooth enamel, and so happy to uh, to have that product available, but 
all codes are not product specific. Like we talked about Essex earlier, Essex can be coded as a uh, space maintainer. It can be coded as this aesthetic appliance that we're now talking about. It can be an orthodontic retainer. Uh, it could be uh, used many different ways. Codes are not product specific. They are procedure specific. And so many times one product can be used or coded using many different uh, CDT codes that are available. So pay attention to how it's using, what the primary purpose was, make sure that your documentation also, that the, uh, the documentation in the clinical chart backs up the, the primary purpose that you are reporting, what CDT code you are reporting. If you're using fluoride, but for the purposes of desensitization, you should use the desensitization code, not a fluoride code, okay? Uh, it's very specific, and it's going to be uh, uh, coded a different way. Um, why does it say that it's only an initial fabrication with the add metal substructure code? I don't believe that it does. I'm going to go back to that uh, code for just a second. And if you look at this one, uh, it's add to acrylic full denture per arch use in metal substructure when, uh, and, and it, it says that it's just used, has to be a metal substructure. It can't be carbon fiber. It can't be some other type of reinforcement. It has to be metal. It has to be a full, complete, removable denture. Okay. And, oh, are you talking about here the side note? Uh, that is in addition, it can be used in either initial fabrication or adding to a, an existing denture already. So that's the word also there. It can also be used to report uh, for initial fabrication. So did not want to confuse you or imply that that could only be used in that situation. That is not true. So uh, is code 9957 billable with evaluations? That's in reference to that new uh, sleep apnea screening code. We'll go back to that one for a second. Uh, it is absolutely billable. Now, most of the pairs that I have seen uh, uh, say something about this, they're uh, going to say that it is the patient's responsibility if you are going to charge that separately. Many of them consider it integral to the evaluation, and so it will not pay for it separately. But they may allow it to be billed uh, uh, or passed on to the patient. Two different words you need to know and you need to make sure you're looking at on your EOBs. That is uh, this, uh, for a disallow versus a deny. If you get a denial on something, that means they're not going to pay it. But you can still charge the patient, okay? Patient can still pay for that out of pocket and should. Um, a disallow is where they're saying, we consider this service integral and because of your contractual obligation, so this would only be in in-network situations, because of your contractual obligation, we will not even allow you to bill this to the patient, okay? And so that's that situation. Uh, so 99.57 is billable with evaluations, but it likely is going to get passed on to the patient and not be reimbursed by the insurer, Okay. Do you, do you recommend to start using the ADA new form? Absolutely. Everybody is already able to process the new 2024 form. Uh, it's just a lot of the practice management softwares have not activated it yet, and it's okay. Uh, when the 2019 claim form came out, it took two years before everybody was fully integrated on that thing. And so uh, one nice thing about the changes that were made this year is they were all additive. None of the box numbers changed. So 35 is still the remarks box, okay? The little check mark that you make for orthodontics, it's still the same spot. None of that changed. All the changes were additive. They were uh, additional boxes that were that were put as an uh, as a uh, as a 11B and an addition to the 11A. And so it was, you know, uh, added on to the same code number for additional information, but it was not changing the information that was already on the code 
uh, are on the uh, claim form. And so that means everybody can still process things the way that they have in the past. If you don't have the new claim form, you're still going to have to write in the date of last, uh, last, last SRP. You're going to have to write in about a locum tenens dentist and give that information separately in the appropriate box. Uh, it's just the new claim form carves that out so that it can be found a little more easily and, uh, and can be auto adjudicated, uh, in the future, uh, uh, a little more easily, but it's okay. If you're not using the new form now, ADA does recommend that you use it and integrate it as soon as you can. Okay. Um, what do you think about OHI? I know we do it for documentation, but are more people coding for it for for that so that we may be compensated for it? There is a code for oral hygiene instruction. Okay, oral hygiene instruction uh, can be coded separately. Normally, it is used for documentation purposes. Uh, I notice it getting paid uh, predominantly through public health, through Medicare, through Medicaid, things like that. Uh, uh, usually with most PPOs, it's not being reimbursed separately. And so there's nothing to prevent you uh, from, from coding it and from charging for it unless you are in network and the, the network contract specifically says that that is not, that is a disallowed service that may not be billed to the patient. So read your contracts. Make sure that you are uh, going through because that is going to be plan dependent. Okay. Uh, not everything I say is going to be a hundred percent across the board. We try to give you the best odds on, uh, on submission. Uh, want you to get paid for all the services that you offer, but there are times where you're going to have contractual handcuffs, uh, because of PPOs that are going to keep you from be getting reimbursed for certain services. That's kind of the price of participation. And so, uh, it's unfortunate but it, it is, it's the price that you're paying. Uh, participating with a PPO is a form of uh, publicity. It is advertising. You are getting in their book. You're getting more patients, more butts and seats. That's the purpose of PPO participation, okay? And so, and, and you need to be sure that you're making sure you're billing out full services or full prices to the uh uh, the PPO, and you're keeping count of what your write-ups are, so you can see and evaluate if participation with a particular plan serves you, or is it more expensive than what it's worth, okay? So, you got to be seeing that. Um, do we have a timeline for when the new claim form has to be used for Delta? Uh, again, there's not a uh, definitive, like, cutoff date uh, that says that they're not going to accept uh, 2019 anymore. Uh, I don't expect to even see that, honestly, for some time. Um, I even know a few practices out there that are unfortunately still using the 2012 claim form and submitting, and they are getting reimbursed off of that, even though it is not the, the updated and accurate form. Uh, but as soon as possible, get to the 2024 form uh, and uh, everybody's going to catch up uh, as soon as you can. So will there be a specific code for a reinforced full upper denture wire mesh? Uh, that is going to be the normal denture code plus the code that we just discussed, which is the 5876. And so that's going to be the denture code uh, that's appropriate, either maxillary or mandibular, plus the metal substructure, uh, code that can go along with it. So you code for them both. Um, so that's for initial fabrication or adding to a prosthesis that's already there. So um, is the 39A new box for the SRP date going to be available in the software to be added to the new form? It should be. Practice management softwares take a little time. It's a big deal to update all those practice management softwares and then roll out all those changes to all the people that use it. So expect it. Uh, it's, it's coming. When it's going to be there is going to be dependent upon your practice management software. If you want to reach out to your rep uh, for uh, uh, your practice management software, they can probably tell you more about when that claim form is going to be available. So uh, let's go from there. Let's see. 
Do you know how much to charge for these new coats? Okay, again, like I said at the beginning, we have ideas about which codes they feel like they're going to reimburse, and we have ideas about, uh, you know, for the plan documents that they just rolled out. Now, at the time of writing Coding with Confidence Manual this year, we didn't have that. We didn't know how these were going to be looked at by new payers, okay? How these new codes were going to be looked at by payers. It normally takes a year or two of a code's existence and usage before they see if a code is actually fully integrated into dental practices. Is it a code that's become commonly used? Is it something that they feel it is worthwhile for them to benefit? Okay, so use the codes, whether you uh, whether they're getting benefited or not, use them, submit them, put them out there. Um, I don't know reimbursement rates as of yet because we haven't seen uh, a single claim reimbursed using one of these codes yet. Uh, so we'll we'll have to kind of determine what the appropriate charges for those will be. Uh, and as those fee surveys come out, uh, we look at five different sources of fee data. We've got several different ones that we that we use. Uh, some seem come out kind of low, some come out kind of high. Uh, we find a good middle ground when we're doing a fee analysis for your practice uh, that we feel is appropriate. We do it by code. We don't do it by percentile. Uh, so um, that's that's going to uh, help you out uh, as well. Someone said henryshinedental.com backslash e-assist doesn't give any results, and I'm not sure about uh, that. You can go to eAssist, which is uh, directly, if you'd like to, which is dentalbilling.com. Uh, we also have resources on dentalcoding.com. And so if you'd like to see our e ebook format, uh, that's all That's all there. Um, so uh, we're already a good 12 minutes over our, uh, our time, but... Uh, Let's see. No, this was not discussed. What about a cone beam upshra, uh, cone beam X-rays, uh, uh, updated codes? There are specific cone beam codes. Uh, they're in the D three nine such and such. You go and look. Uh, there's going to be some different ones there. Ones for less than one jaw. Then there's one for maxillary, one for mandibular, one for both jaws. So use the appropriate CBCT code. Delta has said that they're starting to pay as of this year for some cone beam x-rays. Previously, historically, uh, it was only paid through medical insurance or passed on to the patient. But with Delta making this change, I would not be surprised if other payers start picking this up as well. So if you currently have not been charging for cone beam x-rays, maybe something you want to start doing. Pay attention to those uh the, that code set, which is the uh, the capture and interpretation codes, and also there is another subset of cone beam uh, uh, codes that say capture only. Capture only is for specific situations where you are sending that radiograph for someone else to interpret. So if you're sending it out to the oral surgeon, you're sending it out to the uh, uh, oral maxillofacial radiologist, then those image capture only codes are phenomenal to use. It, it prevents, uh, uh, it keeps your liability low. It says that you are only an imaging center. You took a picture, somebody else is going to diagnose it. Okay. Uh, but if you're doing diagnosis and capture, make sure you're using the correct set of CBCT codes. So that's really all I've got time to cover today. I know there's a few more questions that I, I didn't get a chance uh, to get to. And I apologize for that guys, but, uh, uh, I feel like we, we covered quite a bit, and I hope you got a lot of benefit out of this today. Again, reach out to us at practicebooster.com, uh, eassist.com. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, it's eassist.me. Eassist.me or dentalbilling.com is going to be the uh, appropriate eassist uh, website, uh, dentalbilling.com. Uh, and then, of course, talk to your Henry Shine rep. They can always point you in the right direction and get you connected with us and our resources that are available. So I'll throw it back to you, Shirley. I appreciate everything that you did for us today. Thank you so much for this opportunity and uh, what you got to tell everybody. 
Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Grobmeyer. It was really wonderful listening to you. And thank you for spending more time answering um, all of the questions, a very engaged audience. So it was really wonderful to learn uh, from your presentation and your question and answer session. Um, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We did record today's uh, webinar and we'll be emailing the recording out sometime in the next week. We'd love your feedback via our survey that will pop up on your screen shortly. Thank you all for joining us again, and we look forward to seeing you on future webinars. See you all very soon. Thank you, guys. I greatly appreciate your Thank time you. and attention.